What is it called? Even when you know something is wrong, you go along with it so you don't stick out. You change one's behavior to match that of other people. Ian, conformity on your whiteboard. What is the name of the experiment that teaches us conformity? That people are willing to say a wrong answer because of a group of strangers made them feel like they didn't know. Luke. Ashes, Ashes, line test. On your whiteboard, please tell me. What is it called? It is the process through which the real or implied presence of others can directly or indirectly influence the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors of the individual. Ladies and gentlemen, we experience this every time we open up Instagram. Yes. All right, Alexis, what is it? Social influence. influence. On your whiteboard, please tell me. What is it called when... We, as humans, see people behaving, and we kind of mimic it because, well, everyone else is doing it, so I'll just do it. Like, for instance, at lunch, if you hear a bunch of people start clapping, then you start clapping. And people are like, why are you clapping? And you're like, I don't know, they're clapping. This is called what, Jalissa? Group think. On your whiteboard, what is it called? When Miss Melnick tells you to cover up your shoulders, and you immediately pull on a sweatshirt and cover up your shoulders... But then as soon as you get away from Miss Melnick, you take that sweatshirt off your shoulders. What is it, Lindsay? Compliance. Compliance. On your whiteboard, please tell me. What is it called? When in group think, members feel like they cannot fail. This is why people join uh, fraternities and sororities because you can't take down all of them. Okay, this is why people join gangs, uh, all that stuff. The mob, for instance. What do you got, Nina? Invulnerability. Absolutely. People don't want to be a victim, so they join uh, cults, they join uh, gangs and all that stuff so they can feel powerful. What is it called when, um, for instance, the Nazis are going to portray Jews as weak, stupid, or unreasonable in order to make it easier to blame them. What is it called when we simplify a person in order to make it easier to hate them? Corinne, stereotyping. I don't mind rationalizing if that was an answer you put up. It's not the worst answer. It would never be on the same one as stereotyping. They wouldn't do that to you. Remember, AP Psych is logical. They understand they're very similar. They wouldn't put those two up against each other. So if you put rationalization for that last one, I'm not mad about it. But I was looking for stereotype. But they will never be in the same question because they're very similar. Do we see the see that? Okay. On your whiteboard, please tell me, what is it called when members prevent the group from hearing disruptive but potentially useful information from people who are outside the group. For instance, during World War II, Hitler controlled all media going on in, well, Goebbels did. What is it, Hayden? Insulary. Insulary, absolutely. What do you got? Sure. On your whiteboard, what is it called when a lack of individual responsibility comes from being in a crowd? What is that called? Do we have that down? I don't think you do. All right, I do want to cover this, though. Do you have it somewhere, Hayden? It's a D it's, it is the end of, Is it somewhere? I don't think it is. Okay, all right. So let's go to D individual individuation, please. We read it on the bottom of your focus. Okay, so you do need to know D individuation. Okay, that is when you're in the group, when you are in a group, you feel less personal responsibility. Write it anywhere you want, okay? Individuation. Ladies and gentlemen, this is who you are on the internet. Yeah. Now I hope none of you are trolls in this room. Are you internet trolls? you go online just to pick fights with people? Well, I happen to know a couple. I'm sure I'm Who? Oh, the kids? Oh, no, they changed it. Yeah, it's completely died down, thank God. All right, anyway, moving forward. De-individuation 
is when you take a lack of responsibility for being in the crowd. For instance, this is how people behave on the internet. Um, if you had Facebook, which is your gen is not your generation, which is why pretty much none of you have Facebook, correct? Can we agree? That's not your generation's thing. Uh, it's my generation and my mom loves it, so I can't get rid of it. But there are people who go on Facebook to literally pick fights with other strangers. Have you ever read the comment section underneath an article or on BuzzFeed or whatever you people read? And people are just like saying the most hateful things. That is de-individuation. Do you think a person would go up to another person in real life and say those things to them? But no, but behind a keyboard they feel powerful. One of the most fam uh, famous, ex uh, eh, not example, it's a famous example of this is that a woman was being raped and murdered outside of her apartment building. Uh, in the trash and she started yelling and screaming so her attacker left her and she's yelling and screaming and it's in New York City in the 1970s it's a very famous example and um, she's yelling and screaming and people are looking out the window but no one calls the cops and no one goes out looking so her rapist and soon to be murderer comes back and begins raping her a second time and then eventually does kill her. Now, eventually the next morning, her body is found and they go to the apartment building where she was literally murdered outside of her apartment building. It's in New York in the 1970s, not real air conditioning, so everyone's windows are open. And they went door to door and they were like, hey, did you hear any yelling last night? And they're like, yeah. Did you hear any screaming and fighting? And she, they're like, yeah. Why didn't she do anything? And they're like, ah, oh, I thought someone else was. I thought someone else would. When you see a car accident, how often do you drive by? Raise your hand if you drive by every time. There you go. That's the individuation. Absolutely. Okay. We see someone straight on the side of the road, and you're like, ah, that sucks. Finally, open road. Yeah. <laughs> right? Okay? You're in the group. It's not my fault. Well, if I don't stop, someone else is going to stop and help this poor bum. Correct? Yeah, that's de-individuation. Okay? Is it a common thing or an uncommon thing in our human existence? Super common. All right. We talked about compliance, yes? But indoor? All right, let's do uh, Let me give you a couple examples. Here we go. On your whiteboard, please tell me. I, I want, oh my God, will you buy this $5 box of uh, Girl Scout cookies? If you buy this five and you're like, oh my God, I can totally buy it $5. $5 for Thin Mints? Hell yeah, give me all the Thin Mints you got. And I'm like, oh my God, actually, if you want Thin Mints, it's actually $9. Think about it. You want Thin mints. Oh, you want something special? Ah, oh, man, if you really want thin mints that are most popular, you have to pay a little bit more. What is it, Alexis? Low ball. Low ball. Why is it low ball? Who can raise their hand and tell me why it's low ball? You're going to have an example. You have four or five questions on this gang compliance on your test. So make sure you're listening to it. Annie, why is it low ball? There you go. So I wanted specifically Thin Mints because they're the best ones. But apparently they're coming out with new lemon cookies. New ones? I know, but hey, it might be good. They're coming out with brand new ones, okay? And your girl's got an excuse to indulge, so she's going to, okay? <laughs> anyway, with that being said, okay, so when it's a low ball, you get them to buy in. They're paying money already, but then to get what they actually want, they have to pay more money. That's low ball. Everyone good? That's creepy. What? Sure, Sophia. All right, here we go. So, ladies and gentlemen, I love infomercials. One of my favorite infomercials is the little spray, silicone spray, that if you put on a screen, you can put on the bottom of your boat, and then you can use it as an air glider. And how they get you to buy it, because it's obviously super useful, if you buy one can of this crap, you get four for free. One can, you purchase four for free. What is it, Connor? 
Why is it that's not all? Yeah, you're getting a bunch of stuff for free. If you've ever watched an infomercial, that's how they get you. They're like, oh my god, what a deal. All you have to do is pay shipping and handling? Wow, what an opportunity. On your whiteboard, what is it called when I'm like, oh my god, McCray, for my birthday, I really want to go to Paris. And he's like, no, we can't afford to go to Paris because, holy shit, we're having a kid. And I'm like, fine. Then can we go to San Augustine for the weekend? It's what your girl wanted in the first place. <laughs> what is it, Emily? Door and face. Why is it the door and face, Emily? Because you're asking for a big favor when they say no, then Kind of, but what was always the real goal here, people? To go to St. Augustine. Always was to go to St. Augustine, okay? So I knew I could get what I wanted if I asked for something ridiculous. Like, my man's not taking me to Paris. Shit. I wouldn't want to sit next to this for 10 hours on a flight either, so that makes sense. But um, I can ask for something big and then get something small. On your whiteboard, what is it called? And I'm like, bae. We don't need to do anything big for Valentine's Day. How about I just, you know, how about you write me a really nice card, and I'll write you a really nice card, and then, you know, he's like, yeah, let's do that. I'm like, fine, and then we could just go to, like, a nice dinner. And he's like, sure. And I was like, I'd really love to go to Burns and really, like, you know, get that dessert room. And he'll be like, okay, that's fine. And then I'm like, oh, my God, but if we go to Burns and just get the dessert room, we'll feel cheated because we don't feel as fat as we would if we went to dinner at Burns and at the dessert room, you know? So we need to have the whole experience because how often we'll be able to do this before we have a kid and we have to take, you know, Hank with us. <laughs> McCray will, is dying on the hill of Hank, by the way. He will not get rid of it. What is it called, Caroline? Why is it called foot and door, Caroline? Yeah, because I was like, McCray agreed to a card, and then he agreed to, like, going to the dessert room, and then all of a sudden, we're definitely going to Burns, which, if you're trying to get a reservation for Burns on Valentine's Day, good luck, okay? On your whiteboard. Please tell me, what is it called when, if I do something for you, you owe me something, and I'm going to keep you on that. But you were wrong on the rest one, that last one, if you were on this yeah. one. Madison, what is it? Norm reciprocity. Norm reciprocity. <laughs> if I do something for you, then you need to do something for me. This is how kindergarten works. Yes, we learned this in kindergarten. Okay, and we're still using it and manipulating it as much as we possibly can. All right, here we go. So, obedience. So tomorrow we're going to do the Milgram experiment because uh, it's one of the best experiments of the year. It's absolutely horrifying, but we're going to start with obedience. Obedience is changing one's behavior at the command of an authority figure. Okay? So who can raise your hand and tell me some examples of, like, universal authority figures? Kelly. Parents. Parents. Yeah, your parents get to tell you what to do. True, not true. They pay your bills, you live in their house, yeah. You bet your bottom dollar they get to tell you what to do. Who else is an authority figure? Kate. Like, uh, let's put a little bit more of a context. Like, if you're in high school, like friends, parents, like family, friends. Okay, when you're in someone else's house, let's just call that. It's a universal thing. If you come to my house, you bet your bottom dollar I'm in charge. Okay? Now, if I go to your house, am I the authority figure in your house? Hell no. Hell no. Kate, who else? Law enforcement, absolutely. You'll really piss off a uh, police officer if you act like they are not in charge. Don't do that. Kelly? Your boss or manager. Yeah, your boss, your manager at work. How about doctors? Are they authority figures? If someone says, hey, if there's something like going on and people are kind of worried and they're like, hey, I'm a doctor, do we like, oh, thank God. And like, we divert to their <laughs> expertise, right? What about lawyers? Yeah, we're dealing, I mean, if, we're talking about pouring, you know, putting ice cream into a cone. Is a lawyer the expert in the room? No, but like if we're dealing with things where these people are could be useful, are they going to be the authority figures? Yes. Okay. So when we talk about obedience, you have to obey a lot of people in your life. Can we agree? Do I have a lot of people I have to obey? Yes, absolutely. 
Do I have to value the U.S. government? The police officer pulls me over, do I have to pull over? Yes, absolutely. Okay? Yes, 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 you do. <laughs> yes, you do. Um, I have a boss. I have to make sure Mr. Bush is happy with me. I have a lot of other things. This is obedience. I do things in order to keep myself out of trouble. I flirt with the line. Sometimes. But I do study. Now, the Milgram experiment. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the Milgram experiment. We're going to teach really tomorrow. Okay? We're going to, you're not going to write anything down. Don't write anything down. I'm going to do the Milgram experiment for you tomorrow because it's a good 20 minute lesson. And it's an amazing video for you. You're going to be absolutely horrified by what humans will do. Okay? It's fantastic. But since I have a short class anyway, I'd rather keep moving through content. Is everyone clear? Or you can do it all by yourself for homework. No. I didn't think so. So, here we go. All right, social facilitation. Social facilitation is the tendency for presence of other people to have a positive impact on the performance of an easy task. So when people watch you, we perform these things better. Now, I don't know about you, but I am not, despite the fact that I'm your teacher and you see me every single day in front of large groups. I'm not large groups. Uh, every single day. I'm a, I'm a very private person in my social life. I do not go out that often. Um, I don't like large groups of people, and I'm an introvert to the absolute. I'd much rather read a book at home than like anything else, except going out to dinner. I love eating, but that's a whole other issue. With that being said, even introverts like myself who have like social anxiety perform better when other people are watching them do tasks. So not everything, but I'm talking about a simple task. What would be an example of a simple task? Olivia? Is that a, like, an example? Sure, like what do you got? you're running on base or you run into someone, and then you like, start yeah. running faster. Yeah, the moment you realize you know someone on base shore, you're like, oh shit. And you're just like, <sighs> big breaths. And you're trying not to sound like you're dying, correct? Like you don't want them to think you're about to die. Um, when you are, you know, doing another example of like a basic thing, what Olivia? You're taking a test and the teacher looks over you and you're like, I don't know, you want to look like you're doing well? Yeah. But you're not. <laughs> <laughs> Is that from personal experience in this specific room, Olivia? Kelly. So if you're presenting something in front of your class, you want to look like you yeah. are smart. Yeah. For instance, if you are, if you have like some sort of presentation component to a project, don't you stress about that more than any other part? Because like standing in front of your peers, you don't want to sound like a complete moron. Okay, that's social facilitation. Um, if you knew you were, if you're gonna raise your hand and f ask a question, don't you like think about it a little bit harder in your head, and then you're like, okay, I'm ready to go. Yes, no, that's social facilitation. Okay, then we have, so it improves. So seeing people while you're doing something makes you better. So if you were gonna sing something, you would improve. Social loafing is when people are in a group put less effort. This is why I don't assign group projects. Because A, one person does 90% of the work. So every single person in this room has been assigned a project and you're like, yes, I'm with the smart kids, right? And then you get with those smart kids and you're like, these four, these three other kids are really bright. This is gonna be the best group project ever. And then you realize those bright kids are just as dumb as all the other kids you've worked with because no one wants to do the damn work, correct? Except for Emerson, except for Emerson would be the only person I would want. But like, I wouldn't take the responsibility of Emerson babysitting three morons in a group project. You know what I mean? Yeah. So out of respect for Emerson, I wouldn't assign a project. Okay. Social loafing is when you work in a group and you do less work than you would have if you had the project on your own. Every single person in here has done this, correct? Every single one of you are turds when it comes to group projects. Which is why I don't understand. We know this is science. When people, like for instance, construction workers, have you ever driven by a construction site? There is like one dude digging a hole and like five dudes just like shooting the shit, standing there watching a guy dig a hole. Like one guy's got a broom, he's just resting on like how the broom helping with a hole. 
Like, one's got a rake. There's no freaking leaves, so why is there a rake? Like, and they're all just standing there. I live in downtown Tampa. Everything is under construction. For every one guy working, there's 30 people standing there. You're just like, how is this going to be? They're doing it. That's social loafing. So my perfect example in my head that makes the most sense is construction sites. Because one dude's digging a ditch, four guys are watching. Makes no sense. Okay, so social facilitation, you're improving with people watching. Social loafing is when you're in a group, you do less. So what are attitudes? Attitudes are the tendency to respond positively or negatively towards a certain person, object, idea, or situation. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a couple of opinion questions. My opinion's right, so if you don't agree with my opinion, you're obviously wrong. But other than that, there's no right or wrong answers. Okay, so you're going to go thumbs up, thumbs down. Are we ready? Wait, what? I'm waiting for people to finish writing. So we're just going to do an attitude test. Okay, so you're going to go thumbs up, thumbs down. Ready? Leonardo DiCaprio. Thumbs up, thumbs down. It's kind of like, nah, it's kind of gross. I think that all of it is gross. Uh, Cold Stone Creamery. Best ice cream. Thumbs up, thumbs down. It is so good. Have you not had peanut butter? You're wrong. <laughs> uh, Coca-Cola is better than Pepsi. Yes. I don't really I even drink that much soda. Pepsi is gross. Root beer is better than ginger ale. I hate root beer. I love ginger ale. It's my favorite soda, and I can't be trusted with it because I'll drink a whole case of it in a day. I love it. You have the cranberry flavor? <laughs> <laughs> I've never tried it. I'm a purist. White chocolate chip, uh, white chocolate macadamia nut cookies are the best. Oh my god, people are so fake news. White chocolate is fake chocolate, so. It's so good. But your attitudes are just wrong, people. So, ladies and gentlemen, your attitudes are shaped by people, experiences, things you've gone through, um, and all that stuff. So, when we talk about attitudes, there are three major components of it. The first one is affective, which is your emotional response. Okay, here. So, affect. This is your emotional response, okay? So effective is your emotional response. Then you have a behavioral component and then a cognitive component. So all of your behaviors are shaped by emotion, physical, and cognitive. So in your application, every opinion you have. So. Right. You need to know it's shaped by three aspects. Behavioral, cognitive, and emotional. Or effective. So, I think cookies is a great reason. So, on your whiteboard, I want you to write at the top of your board what your favorite type of cookie is. Mine is white chocolate macadamia. I want you to give me an emotional reason why you like that cookie. My grandma used to make them. My grandmother is no longer with us. So every time I think about white chocolate chip cookies, I'm always like, oh my god, my grandma. That's really sweet. Behavioral. Um, behavioral is because um, I love cookies. And when I'm stressed, I eat cookies. So behavioral is when I am like super stressed out. Fresh Market has bomb white chocolate milk. By the way. And cognitive component. My favorite place in the whole wide world is Hawaii. And guess where macadamia nuts come from? It makes me remember my favorite vacation. So, on the top, write down your favorite cookies. Give me an emotional reason why you love that cookie. Give me a behavioral reason why you love that cookie. And give me a cognitive reason. You don't have a favorite cookie, Connor. Cookies are such an odd option. Like I can't yeah. Emotional. I don't like yeah, I, I don't. Yeah. I just. That's true. Yeah. I, like I'm not saying you're not allowed to be emotional. Like. <laughs> 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 not I feel a little judged. <laughs> Fine. Your favorite food item. How's that? Can, can you be passionate about a food item? Fine. 
I am. You can say what cookies, girl. I did you not hear my ABCs of uh, <laughs> white chocolate macadamia nut? Come up with a favorite food item and tell me what is your why do you have that feeling towards it? Cognitive is why. Like uh, like for instance, um, I lasagna. For in, I hate lasagna personally. I think it's absolutely disgusting. It's just awful. It's so gross. Like ugh. I don't like pasta. I don't like ricotta cheese. I, I'm Italian, by the way. <laughs> Don't tell my people. However, a uh, behavioral reason why a lot of people like uh, lasagna is because it's really easy to make, and you can make it a couple days ahead, and it freezes really well. So, like, a lot of people make lasagna very often. Like, it's a common, like, comfort food because you can reheat it quickly and stuff like that. Yeah, it's easy. Everyone likes them. Everyone enjoys them. You know, I mean, no one hates chocolate chip cookies. I love chocolate. I've met people that say. You know, there's just something classic about it, especially salty chocolate chip cookies. I've had whole. Oh, those yeah. are so good. I just like going to the public space. No, go to Fresh Market. They have better cookies. Actually, they do. Like, <laughs> like, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's very easy to make. You can make large batches of them. You have plenty of them. Hunter, hi. Stand on here to babysit. Do your job. Well, hey, sweetie, when you invite me, but when you do your job in my classroom. I can't count. you got to give me more time than that. What would cognitive be again? Hi, smart. Do what you're supposed to do. This is not just me bullshitting and wasting time, sweetie. You need this stuff. What would cognitive is the logical reason why you like something. Like, for instance, um, uh, memory, like some sort, yeah, it's like a memory, like you distinctly have a tie to. Like, um, I don't know. Like, there's a cognitive reason why I wore this shirt all semester, first, uh, every Monday. Now it's just like a pattern. It's because it was super drapey, and I just didn't have to, like, worry about it. Yeah, which is fine. I mean, I wear the same. I wear a small rotation of stuff, especially this year. It was a very small rotation because, like, your gut was coming through. Um, but, like, I would wear this every Monday. Cognitively, the reason why I was wearing this particular shirt is not because I'm particularly fashionable because this is obviously not fashion, is because it's like super drapey. And it was easier to hide. Not anymore. Turn to your neighbor and explain your ABCs of attitude, why you feel the way you feel about whatever food item you chose. Turn around and tell them. Go. You lucky ducks. Goodbye. I lecture. Yeah, we're in social psychology too, which isn't hard. It's just a lot of stuff.